Greetings once again. We are, uh, according to the calendar and the administration's request uh, for midterm grades, at the uh, halfway point, officially at the halfway point of the uh, semester, uh, I would say that we are coming out of the tunnel for the, um, for the second half. But I don't know how much of us uh, are actually getting a break. Uh, not with, a, you know, not just one, but uh, many classes. Nevertheless, uh, we uh, move west in our um, study of world regional geography. And uh, it's a region that uh, we're heading into that's uh, never without much to talk about. Uh, there's always much going on. In fact, uh, prepping uh, for these uh, uh, units, uh, every uh, every semester, every other semester. This one always takes a little more time because things are changing. Things are constantly changing. We'll see some of that uh, even here uh, today. Um, and I speak of North Africa and Southwest Asia, uh, otherwise known as the Mideast. So uh, in re regard to that, you can turn to um, page, I believe it's 322, 322 map there and um you know it's uh one of those things where the objectives uh will uh change from semester to sem semester as well so in that regard the objectives here i want to uh recognize i want us to recognize the region as the world's religious hearth we'll look at the uh, and understand the importance of water politics uh, in the region, explain where and why Pan-Arabia and Islamism has been effective and where it has not been effective, and become aware of Jerusalem's significance, not only in the region, but internationally as well. Some major heads up terms for this uh, particular chapter, the Middle East, Middle East, the Western uh, term for Southwest Asia and North Africa, uh, monotheism, uh, the belief in one God, uh, the diaspora, the diaspora, we're talking about the um, dispersing of the Jews out of Israel in AD 70, we'll dwell on that a little bit uh, more, obviously, uh, Shiite and Sunni Muslims, uh, Shiite Muslims, more conservative, Sunni, uh, more moderate, uh, calligraphy, the major art form of, um, of Islam, uh, yeah, based off of, um, you know, imagery that uh, is depicted from the, the Quran, the holy book. Farsi is a language, a Persian language uh, spoken in Iran. Uh, OPEC, a oil cartel, the organization of petroleum and exporting countries. Uh, Pan-Arabism. -Arab and Arabism is um, the idea of one gigantic um, is, uh, Arabian state, right? All the nations combined. Uh, the Arab League uh, is uh, a uh, consortium, you know, of that idea. They uh, meet regularly. Uh, Islamism. Islamism, we're looking there at... Um, Maybe the radical elements of uh, of, of Islam, uh, the caliphate. Uh, caliphate. Uh, you hear, heard a lot about that uh, in the news in the last uh, couple of years with uh, with ISIS. And um, again, that is looking at uh, setting up a caliphate of um, a territory, a former territory of uh, Muslim territories, uh, run by a um, a caliphate. Again, to set up a, a one Islamic state uh, under the leadership of a um, caliph, successor looked at as a successor to Muhammad, right? Uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the Arab Spring was um, you know, roughly about 2010 to 2012, and it was um, kind of a, a sort of a mini revolution uh, to. Um, you basically kick out leaders, Arab leaders that uh, and maybe were too friendly with the West, 
weren't uh, serious enough about Islamic law as they should have been, where, uh, you know, uh, where um, some of the extremists didn't feel they uh, were as uh, serious about that. So the Arab Spring, those, about a two year period. Jihad's a holy war, we'll talk about that. Khomeini, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini out of Iran, who um, led a successful Islamic revolution in, uh, starting in 1979, culminating in 83. Uh, Sharia law, right? Sharia law is um, you know, based off of Muhammad's uh, uh, works and, and writings. Uh, Medina, we'll talk about Medina. Medina is one of the holy cities in Saudi Arabia. And uh, if you go to a lot of towns uh, in um, that part of the world, there are historic regions in uh, each of these towns and cities uh, called Medinas. Uh, the Quran, right, the, um, the Muslim holy book, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, back in the news again. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, basically formed to um, kick the Jews out of Israel. And then the Hadith. The Hadith, uh, probably something that's read more by Muslims actually than the, uh, the Quran does. I'll introduce you uh, to that uh, uh, briefly as well. So let's take a look at um, this um, section here. And um, northern northern Africa, and um, looking at uh, setting up the first points here, northern Africa and Southwest Asia, uh, it's it's relatively small, relatively small, with nearly twelve percent of the world's land and six uh, percent of the world's population. Yet it has been one of the world's most influential regions. Goes without saying, commonly referred by the misnomer uh, the Middle East. Uh, the region's long served as a physical and, and uh, cultural crossroads uh, connecting Europe, Africa, and, uh, and uh, East Asia, or Asia, Asia proper, I suppose. Uh, home to early civilizations and the birthplace to three uh, major uh, religions. Uh, the recent history of the region uh, is one marked by uh, high population growth, uh, oil wealth, and a lot of political conflict. Getting back to religion, religion um, has played a major role in defining the um, cultural identity uh, of the region. Um, three important monotheistic uh, religions, uh, Judaism first, right, then Christianity, and a little later Islam. Uh, all originated here, and uh, all three are found, you know, throughout the world today. Uh, well, Islam is the dominant uh, religion uh, of uh, Northern Africa and Southwestern Asia. It's far from homogenous. It's far from homogenous. Uh, while a majority of Muslims are, are Sunni Muslims or Sunnites, key divisions exist there. Uh, uh, with, the, with the faith. For example, you have Shia Muslims or Shiites. Shia Muslims, uh, they account for 90% of the Iranian uh, population and um, about, um, I'd say, 60% uh, of the Iraqi. I was going to say majority of the Iraqi population. That's true, but I think I could be uh, exact and say about 60% or more specific, about 60% of the Iraqi uh, population. But you have pockets of Christianity and uh, Judaism are found in, in Lebanon, Israel, and, and uh, parts of Egypt. You have a large Coptic uh, Christian community in Egypt. Uh, Arabic is the most widely spoken language in the region, approximately about 50% uh, of the region's population. Although it's not as dominant, uh, it's not as dominant as uh, a, a language as, as uh, Islam is uh, a religion in the region. Uh, Farsi, the Farsi language, and Turkish are other widely spoken languages, and you have smaller numbers that speak Berber, uh, Hebrew, and, uh, and Kurdish. 
Okay, let's take a look at, at the uh, first section here, and you got you have some fills here right off the bat. Uh, Middle East, your first blank there, get you started. Uh, Middle East, um, this is a Eurocentric term. This is a Eurocentric term. Uh, Southwest Asia is, and I'm going to be politically correct here with the way I say this, Southwest Asia is the culturally sensitive term, if you will. Let's take a look at cultural and political history uh, within a, a wider world. Uh, religions, 100 AD, 1000 AD, 1000 AD, uh, monotheism. Monotheism dominated uh, the region, uh, Judaism, and then it was Christianity and uh, Islam. Islam about 622 AD, uh, actually much later. Monotheism was um, a very radical concept. Um, for the time uh, when it first emerged, because everything you know, the, uh, the world was very polytheistic. Judaism uh, in AD seventy, uh, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and dispersing Jews uh, throughout the region and Europe, called the Diaspora. The Jews, I just uh, you don't have to write this down. Just a little historical background there, if you don't know the Jews. Um, that was the promised land to them, and these heathen Romans, uh, they were under captivity of, uh, from the Romans, and the Romans weren't the first to hold the Jews captive in that, that, that area, but um, the, um, you know, the Jews were continuing to, uh, they had various people crop up claiming to be messiahs after Jesus, and the uh, Zionist movement to um, rid the Romans. And the Romans finally, you know, Main Street colloquialism had, had enough and uh, dispersed them, AD 70. And not to return um, officially, politically, legally until 19, 1948. Uh, Christianity. Christianity had divisions over uh, who Jesus was. You had your Orthodox Christians and your Catholic Christians. So from about 395 AD till... Uh, 1453, uh, the Eastern Church was in Constantinople, or modern-day Istanbul, Turkey, and the Western Church headquartered uh, in Rome. Islam, the holy book, the uh, Quran, the word of Allah, right, revealed to Muhammad. Uh, the Shiites, the Shia, comprise about 90% of Iran, 60% of, e uh, uh, of Iraq, uh, they're in a more conservative wing of, uh, of the religion. Uh, most, uh, most, um, most Muslims uh, would probably consider themselves Sunni. Uh, page uh, 330 in your um, textbooks. You can turn to that. I think that's the one that gives you uh, the major religions uh, inset map of Northern Africa, Southwestern Asia. All right, nice color-coded map there for you to take a look at for your visual types. I got a set of notes here, some white space and your lecture models, languages, briefly talk about languages. Uh, Arabic is spoken by about 50% of those in the region. The majority Muslim group is Sunni, based on the Quran, supplemented by tradition. Sunnis are the moderate wing of the Muslim sect. Calligraphy. Calligraphy, uh, the most important art form as it contains uh, religious significance uh, of the Quran. Uh, just really gorgeous writing. Gorgeous writing. Not to write this down. My, kind of my opinion. Uh, I think it would be yours too if you examined it, this gorgeous writing, uh, visible expression, uh, I think some of the highest forms of art, to be uh, quite candid about it. And then you have your Indo-European languages are significant. Uh, Farsi. Farsi is the official language of Iran. Uh, page uh, 331. 
is an inset map of um, yes the language families right of the uh, of the region we love our maps in here don't we and uh, page 326 I'm gonna briefly talk I'm gonna give uh, the um, climate a little love here I usually don't do that with um, you know, with the uh, the units uh, as I just briefly go through this you can you don't have to write anything down you can look at the uh, the map on page 326 I'm presenting special about their climate as some of the others that I um, gloss over but um, arid climates you have arid climates that dominate the region humid climates are found in, in the uh, mountainous areas of uh, northwestern Africa and Turkey as well as the eastern Mediterranean as a result I think this is one of the reasons why I want to touch in on this because water politics uh, really shapes a lot of the tension in the region, which you don't hear about a lot. Uh, water is scarce, right? It's a scarce commodity throughout the region uh, and human activity where uh, agriculture or urbanization is concentrated in, uh, you know, your major, your major river valleys and other locations where there is a significant amount of water. Uh, that's uh, that's available. Uh, rapid rapid population increase has increased. Uh, focus on the regions, uh, some of the regions problems, um, and uh, salinization, water salinization. Um, the water that uh, you can get uh, has salt in it, right? And uh, until recently, not too many uh, of the um, countries had the um, technology to get salt out of the water, which has caused problems as well. Okay, there's our, our um, SOP, to, um, SOP to the climates. I'm going to start getting into now, uh, we're getting into um, the strategic um, placement of the, of the region, and I'll set this up here. Uh, Northern Africa and Southwestern Asia, uh, it's, a, it's a long history of uh, empires and uh, trade throughout Africa and uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, these you have your contemporary uh, political issues that are defined by a handful of issues that emerged uh, following the end of European uh, domination uh, in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s. Uh, chief among these are Pan-Arabism, which was spurred by the creation of the state of Israel, right? More on that coming up. And political Islamism, right? more on that as well. Uh, as important politically as economically are these huge, but uh, disproportionately uh, distributed oil and gas resources uh, in the region. Uh, the largest reserves are found around the Persian Gulf and uh, global demand for uh, you know, petroleum has generated uh, just enormous wealth, right? Enormous wealth um, for uh, these, these oil rich countries. Uh, a major force in the production and pricing of oil is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum uh, Exporting Countries. So these scarce uh, water resources uh, end up limiting uh, agriculture and, um, the, and, it, and also affect the um, distribution of the population, which is concentrated uh, along the, uh, the coasts and just a few of the uh, region's uh, major rivers. Uh, although birth rates have declined in the past three decades, uh, overall population and growth in the region uh, still continues to be uh, be high. Uh, rates of urbanization are also high, particularly in the oil-rich uh, countries. Uh, human rights abuses. Human rights abuses are a concern in uh, throughout the region. Uh, all the women's rights have increased in many countries. Uh, religious and ethnic minorities in many of the region's countries fight against continued oppression and uh, and persecution. In fact, um, looking ahead at the week, I 
have a, um, uh, I'm going to have you guys look at the Freedom House and take a look at um, um, these types of things, religious and political persecutions. And I want you to see eh, how in the dark this region is uh, about that uh, type of thing. I think I'm even going, I'm thinking about putting on there, I want you to, uh, the Voice of the Martyrs website and uh, maybe peruse through that too. Uh, Christians. Christians have always taken a, taken a big hit uh, in uh, this region. We talk about, um, you know, perhaps some alleged discrimination in this country toward Muslim Americans. Um, this isn't my opinion. If you take a look at, um, you know, what's going on in that part of the world to uh, Christians, it makes uh, generally what anything that... Uh, uh, Arab Americans are, uh, have to endure here seem uh, particularly uh, uh, particularly mild. Let's take a look uh, here at this um, the strategic location, and um, yeah, I got some fills fill in the blanks there. Uh, after World War II, after World War II, um, Southwest Asia, North Africa became um, strategic. Uh, in light of war tension with Israel, uh, the Cold War, and that huge demand for oil. Uh, page 339 in your uh, textbooks, I think that's the map there I have. It has a lot of oil fields, some of the major oil fields. Yes, I think you'll find that interesting, working oil fields and uh, where the known oil deposits are. Pan-Arabism, right? Pan-Arabism is united opposition, united opposition, um, and this uh, spawn uh, create of the Arab League, and it's united opposition to the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, 1945, as a response to the cr uh, creation of Israel, it started out initially uh, seven nations. Uh, today it's 21, right? It includes the Palestine, uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. Uh, Egypt uh, was expelled in uh, 1979 as a result of an accord with Israel, recognizing uh, Israel's existence. You know, Anwar Sadat was uh, the um, president of uh, Egypt at the time, and as a result of that, he ended up losing his life in 1981. Uh, headquarters uh, went from Cairo, Egypt, to uh, Tunis, Tunisia, as a result of that as well. Now, Islamism. Islamism is the, this is where you, you know, you get your holy wars and jihads, the extreme uh, militant end of, uh, of Islam. Um, political Islam really has only had a victory in, uh, in, in one place. It had some momentum under the Arab Spring, but um, its victory was in Iran, 1979. Um, Jihad, the Holy War, uh, the Iran-Iraq War, 1980 and 88. Uh, again, their main success, 1979, uh, the Islamic Revolution under Khomeini uh, in, in Iran. Uh, Islamic law was set up, uh, which is basically Sharia law, and that became official in Iran in 1983. Uh, and we talk about Sharia law, we're talking about you know, the sacred law of Islam. But uh, again, as I said, extreme terrorism uh, has yet to yield much, uh, much if, um, if anything uh, in, uh, in, in that regard. Now, um, your um, caliphate, right? Your caliphate, the uh, caliphate looks to... Um, uh, develop an Islamic uh, uh, oh, ISIS. I'm talking about your blank. Your blank there should be ISIS. ISIS looked to um, establish a um, Islamic caliphate. And just a kind of a side note on that that you guys might find interesting. If you take a look, and I've had students do this in my live class. If you kind of Google where ISIS was 
doing battle and looking to set up their caliphate. It's basically the old Ottoman Empire that Turkey used to have, right? It was controlled by the Muslims. And after the uh, Crimean War, uh, Turkey was severely weakened. Russia was weakened. Uh, and uh, the Western European powers, England, France, were uh, strengthened after that. And the British, especially, ended up carving a lot of that region up. And uh, ISIS was you know, basically looking to get that territory back. Like I said, if you uh, compare the old Ottoman Empire, the boundaries of it, and what ISIS looked to get back, that was basically what they were trying to do. Uh, revive the old, well, not revive the old Ottoman Empire, but um, reestablish control over uh, those former, um, former Islamic uh, areas. And then the Arab Spring, uh, revolutionary wave of demonstrations, bringing down repressive regimes uh, um, throughout the Arab League countries, uh, mid-2010 to mid-2012. Mid uh, looking back at the Arab Spring now, um, the individuals who uh, were, you know, looked to, to, to be brought in uh, to replace the Muammar Gaddafi's in Libya and the Hazmi Babarak's in Egypt were uh, arguably more radical than than uh, even those uh, even those individuals. Oil reserves or oil resources. Uh, the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is believed to contain uh, close to um, 70 percent, 70 percent of the uh, world's oil resources or reserves. Again, uh, page 339 um, is, a, a, again, a good map to, uh, you know, show you where, um, you know, where the working oil fields are. And there's a also, a um, estimated proven reserve um, graph there. Uh, I would say too, and this gets back to what I said at the top of all this. As things change, uh, the United States now, uh, with um, the, the uh, fracking movement, uh, it's looking uh, as though that uh, the United States proper may have um, as much or more. Uh, oil reserves and oil resources than uh, the, many of those countries put together, right? And uh, arguably for the first time, um, we are you know, fairly energy independent now because of fracking. And there are arguments about, uh, about that, right? Environmental uh, types of um, discussions, which uh, kind of out of the purview of what I want to do here uh, right now. But um, so that leads to the Organization of Petroleum of Exporting Countries, OPEC, very powerful uh, oil cartel. Uh, this cartel is um, uh, it's an organization that coordinates the interest of producing countries, these producing countries, by regulating uh, uh, prices. Uh, you know, for example, OPEC headquartered in uh, it's headquartered in Vienna. And it's made up of 12 countries. Water politics, water politics, very big. Water is, uh, it's uh, not evenly distributed. It's not evenly distributed. 80% uh, of the region's water is found uh, in the uh, uh, Nile and Tigris and Euphrates river basins. Uh, in the future, water may surpass. Uh, oil as the critical resource in uh, in southwestern Asia, and uh, page three forty two. Page three forty two uh, is uh, a map there of um, population distribution, and you can see uh, folks are camping out along the rare uh, river valleys and uh, the Mediterranean region. And as you saw with the climate map earlier, that you know so much of this region is uh, hot, arid, and uh, and desert. 
population distribution dynamics, and you can keep that map open on page 342. Uh, the major cause of uh, high population is the is water availability. Uh, and keep that in the back of your mind as we get into Israel here coming up in a few minutes. Um, Tunisia um, did something a little different regarding their population. Tunisia reduced population growth uh, shortly after gaining independence. Uh, maximum age for marrying and family planning they set up. Uh, 1964 law, uh, polygamy was outlawed. Um, uh, marriage, uh, 15 to 17 years of age for girls and then 18 to 20 years of age uh, for boys. They could begin marrying. Um, the life expectancy of the region is about 70 years of age. Uh, only a rock dipped below 60. And uh, we know what that was about, right? War and deprivation there. Then you have your urban patterns. Uh, much of North African cities um, surround these enclaves of old uh, trading and agricultural centers. So you have these uh, high uh, densities of how homes, um, commercial premises and public buildings within, uh, within cities uh, in, uh, marked by traditional small towns uh, of the region and their central medinas, which I talked about earlier, named after the second Muslim city in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, valued for social and structural fab fa fabric as historical sectors. And page 346 gives you a little um, illustration of one of those sectors of a city and what you could find there. Human rights, uh, literacy, 67% of the men are literate and just 28% uh, of the women. Uh, Kurds in northern Iraq, uh, long pressed for their own territory, Kurdistan, um, and because the, the Kurds um, stretch, but uh, their population stretches in northern Iraq, but over in through Turkey and, and Syria as well. And uh, page 359 gives you an illustration uh, of that as well. Turn to page 350. And then page 350 is uh, starting to make my way here toward um, the last couple of points here on Israel, the big one, right? Israel and the Palestinian territories, and uh, followed up by Turkey and uh, Iran. Many of the countries, as I set this up here, many of the countries of northern Africa have strong ties with France and uh, Algeria. Algeria struggled with, um, and you can see this on page 350, a, a fundamentalist Islamic insurgency uh, throughout much of the 1990s. And after nearly three decades of supporting anti-Western terrorism, uh, Libya, Libya under Muammar Gaddafi made significant steps toward normalizing relations with Western governments in uh, the early 2000s. Egypt and Sudan, have um, many similarities, the most prominent being the dominant influence of the Nile River, right, that streams through there, uh, just has tremendous influence on all aspects of society in those countries. Now, while Egypt has, um, while Egypt has a stronger and more rapidly growing economy than, than Sudan, uh, both countries have struggled with internal conflict and uh, a rapidly you know, growing population. And you can see three, page 355, that region, the Nile River's influence. Here page 359, the Arab Southwestern Asian region is a um, study in contrasts. Uh, there are substantial oil reserves, but uh, most are concentrated near the Persian Gulf and the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. And while oil 
has brought enormous wealth to, to many of these countries uh, in the sub-regions. Uh, countries without the oil uh, struggle economically. Israel. Israel is unique in the region. Uh, it, it was created by the United Nations for the Jewish people. And uh, the country has struggled throughout its existence since 1948 with political and ethnic conflict uh, involving neighboring countries and the resident Palestinian population. Uh, Israel is also economically extinct from its neighbors with a diversified high-tech economy. And you can turn to page 366. And I would say as we go through this chapter, uh, that the particular section of the uh, of the of the chapter, you might want to uh, roam through there and get familiar with uh, some of the maps. Um, it'll help you with some of the exercises. Yeah, 366, 367. 368, 369 is going to be important to you. Uh, yeah, 366 through 370. When we get toward the end of the week and discussion questions, and you know, you're going to need to know uh, about that section. But and then you have um, Turkey and Iran, right? Non-Arab countries. And you can turn to page 370 for this. Turkey and Iran, non-Arab countries located between Russia and uh, the neighboring countries of the old Commonwealth of Independent States of the old Soviet Union and the oil fields of the Persian Gulf are uh, rugged countries with uh, long histories of dynastic rule. Of the two, Turkey has much stronger ties with Western countries, uh, being a member of NATO and possible future member of the European Union. Um, Turkey has a diversified economy but the Iranian economy is tied to uh, oil production. So you have some notes space there after human rights. And I'll talk about Israel and the uh, Israel and the Palestinian Palestinian territories. Israel like I said earlier, was uh, constructed, well, was developed in uh, 1948 by the United Nations with the expressed concern of you know, basically not having another situation like what was had with Nazi Germany. And that was really the impetus of all that. Uh, you had that genocide. And it was like, you know, I think the, the, the thinking at the United Nations was, you know, we can't have this again. So, you know, what do we do? And they decided that, hey, now is the time, right, to develop an area for the, uh, the Jews to be able to go back to their historic promised land. So with the help of the UN, they established a new country in 1948. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. You had Arabs, Palestinians, that were already there, right? So with Jewish presence, um, many were displaced into neighboring countries, right? Jordan and Egypt and so forth. Uh, straining water resources, right? You're in Jordan, uh, you have problems with water, right? You don't need thousands of Palestinians, right? You get the picture. Um, streaming into some of these neighboring countries. So not only do you have a, a religious uh, re a religious patch uh, coming into the uh, fabric of uh, an Arab fabric, but you also have uh, this um, you know, the, this advent of the this new population, straining your, re your water resources. So Israel ended up um, proclaiming Jerusalem as its capital. Ended up proclaiming Jer Jerusalem as its capital. 
And um, there are many problems with that. And I've always said that, um, you know, we talked earlier about water politics. And I think it's possible that water politics, the water could be solved, that problem could be solved. But the uh, problem of Jerusalem, uh, I don't, uh, I personally don't ever foresee that uh, ever being solved. Here's some, here's Jerusalem's importance. All right, Jerusalem's importance uh, in the region. Let me get my notes here. I got papers strewn all over the place here for this section. Jerusalem's importance for Jews. For Jews, and you have some fill in the blanks here, for Jews, Jerusalem is the, the capital city of the nation of Israel where King Solomon built the temple of God, which was completely destroyed in AD 70 uh, by the Romans, which I mentioned earlier. Jerusalem is the site of the Western Wall, and the Western Wall is the last remains of David's temple. And the temple that David built. So it was this city that the Jews believe God called his own. So you have the significance there for the Jews. Uh, Jerusalem's importance for Muslims. Uh, for Muslims, there is the Dome of the Rock. And if you take a look at your uh, textbook on page 368, I believe, there is the... Um, picture, right, of the Dome of the Rock there on the left, beautiful structure, right, the Dome of the Rock, and to is to uh, Muslims, this is where Muhammad, their prophet, made a uh, nighttime journey to the heavens, nighttime journey to heavens, and it's where Muslims believe um, their prophet ascended into heaven, okay, very significant importance, right, to both the Jews and uh, the Muslims. Uh, Jerusalem's importance for as uh, for Christians. Jerusalem's importance to uh, Christians. Uh, Jerusalem has always been significant to Christians because of the places where um, Jesus had his ministry, right? Where Jesus had his ministry. And most importantly, where he died and is believed by Christians to, to, have, um, to have risen again. So, as I said, I mean, you might be able to solve the water problems, but this one here, I just don't know, personally, if I can say that, if this will ever be solved. And uh, this is really the crucible of the problem when you hear about the Middle East, right? You've got water issues, and uh, you have the religious difference, uh, the, the problems of religious differences, but Jerusalem, right, that's, that, that, that's the, major, the major issue. And then lastly, um, Turkey and Iran. Turkey and Iran, what did I want to say about that? Um, historic rivalries between the two. Historic rivalries. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about, uh, about Israel. And you can put this up by your notes. Uh, Israel proclaimed Jerusalem as a capital in 1950. Um, the United States... Uh, well, up until recently, the United States and most countries did not recognize this, and they would keep uh, their embassy in Tel Aviv. Again, Jerusalem is the, the problem in the overall picture, but as we realized, or as we uh, saw in the last couple of years, uh, President Trump uh, came out and recognized Jerusalem uh, as the capital and has, has moved the uh, American embassy <laughs> to Jerusalem, right? A very, very... Um, provocative move, right? Is it not? All right, Turkey and Iran. Turkey and Iran, uh, uh, political Islam's victory uh, was in Iran. Was in Iran uh, before World War I. Um, Southwest Asia was ruled by the Ottoman Empire, which became modern Turkey. Uh, historic rivalries, um, they share a strategic location uh, between Russia, and neighboring countries and the Southwest uh, Asian oil fields. And then uh, you had the 1980 to 88 uh, Iran-Iraq war. Uh, Turkey was supplying both countries with food and manufacturing goods in exchange for oil. Uh, but because they were helping the Iraqis out 
at times um, that caused uh, dissensions with uh, with Iran. There you have that. Um, you are a graphic organizer. You can get that out. I have that posted. Uh, I'm going to uh, just recap. And then we'll talk about what's ahead, and I will uh, bid you a farewell. Um, we talked today about cultural and political aspects, uh, the religions, uh, monotheism, the three major religions. You had the diaspora. The Jews were basically kicked out of the region in AD 70 by the Romans. Christianity, you had the church split. And uh, in Islam, you have the Sunnis and the Shiites, right? You have um, different interpretations of the Quran. Uh, languages, uh, Arabic, 50% of the region speaks, uh, speaks Arabic. And uh, you have the Farsi language in um, in, uh, in, in Iran. Art, talk about calligraphy, right? Religious symbolism from the uh, Quran. The area strategic, right? During the Cold War, uh, the oil was there, right? You have the Americans and the Soviets looking to develop client states there because of the oil reserves. Uh, one of the big reasons why uh, Israel is, um, you know, became a strategic uh, ally of ours, right? They're in that region. 70% um, of the reserves before, you know, before the fracking uh, was known to be in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Israel, uh, Cold War alliances, uh, the Arab League, Pan-Arabism, uh, movement to get Israel, drive them out of the region. Islamism, the uh, radical end of, uh, of, of, uh, of Islam, only really uh, is successful in Iran, right? Between 1979 and 1983, the Islamic Revolution there. OPEC, very powerful uh, oil cartel, they market oil prices, um, the organization of petroleum exporting countries. Uh, water politics are huge, right? Water is not evenly distributed. Population, right? You have uh, water availability, scarce, right? So people congregate, you know, where the where the water is. Uh, life expectancy, about 70 years of age, a little lower in Iraq because of the war. Uh, cities there uh, surround old agricultural centers and trade centers. You have your Medinas uh, in uh, the Muslim cities. Human rights, got some problems there, right? Literacy rates. Uh, the treatment of the Kurds and uh, treatment of religious minorities is uh, completely awful uh, in the region. And then Israel, right? Jerusalem, major, the major problem, right? The major issue. Jerusalem, uh, Israel was created in 1948 and is also that created problems with the water politics. Turkey and Iran, former Ottoman Empire, Turkey, uh, again, political Islam. Uh, was successful in Iran. Rivalry, strategic between Russia, um, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and oil fields. And Turkey assisted in the 1988-88 Iran-Iraq War in exchange for oil. So, what's coming up? Wednesday, um, I'll have these posted. I'll have these posted uh, today. Um, got some analysis questions, kind of, kind of taking you through uh, the uh, you know the work that we did today. And again, all these things are always pegged at a quiz, really. Uh, the reading, the reading is going to be important to your discussion question later in the week. I want to do another point uh, counterpoint on pages three sixty eight, three sixty nine. This develops the controversy, uh, the outlook of the Palestinians, the Jews, and the, and the rest of the Arab world um, in regard to Jerusalem, Israel's existence, right? Um, and um, I kind of, I guess today gave you a little um, prior knowledge to, to all that to kind of uh, set that up for you. Um, I've got a reading too um, that will... I'll probably include in the discussion questions um, Trump's peace plan. 
Uh, recently, Trump met with uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bayran. Um, he's been in touch with the Saudis about the um, recognition of Israel. And uh, this would be huge um, because if we take a look at the Muslim world, right, that, that area, there seems to be a big power struggle with the Iranians and the Saudi Arabians. And uh, it looks like Trump may be looking to not only isolate the Iranians, but maybe even the Palestinians too, at establishing peace in the region with, uh, with uh, the Israelis. But I want you to take a look at how he uh, is doing this with a, a short article, Trump's Peace Plan. I'm going to have you take a look at uh, freedomhouse.org and perhaps the Voice of the Martyrs and take a look at um, you know, political, religious freedoms around the world and where it's okay and where it's not so okay. And uh, the not so okay will, I think, uh, relate a little bit to what we're you know, looking at uh, out this week. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we got the uh, the regulars, right, uh, in the news on Thursday, Friday through Sunday, the discussions, and uh, Monday we'll quiz, and then we'll begin uh, looking, going a little farther south in the uh, continent, uh, Africa, south of the um, south of the Sahara. Now I'll get all this set up. Um, I have face-to-face -face classes uh, today as you guys are looking at this on a Monday, I have face-to-face -face classes, and I usually don't get, get done with those till about 1.45, and I'm making a habit of looking at my phone as I'm walking out of the building to see if everyone is able to access everything, and sometimes uh, some of my faithful friends are um, telling me, hey, professor, we can't get such and such a thing because it hasn't been published yet or whatever. And uh, I, um, I say all that to say that probably around, if that's the case, around uh, between two and three o'clock, probably around closer to three o'clock, uh, I'll take care of it. Uh, but do, if, there, if there's a problem, if I forget one of those many details, continue to uh, let me know, right? Continue to let me know. But um, I will, uh, probably around 3 o'clock when I get back to my desk, I will straighten that out. Hopefully, I'll have it all ready to go. But uh, I do, uh, you guys know who you are. I appreciate uh, your your uh, faithfulness uh, with all of that. So, I think that's it from here. And uh, again, if you guys, uh, again, have issues, uh, you know uh, how to get a hold of me. And uh, I think I'm fairly uh, accessible, right? Uh, on those types of things. So um, until next time, um, I will uh, bid you a, a fond adieu, and you guys have a, uh, just hope you guys have a, a great week, and uh, talk to you later. Bye-bye.